fun to talk a little bit about wood turning with you if you're game. I have so many questions. I am game. You might not like what I say, but I'm, I'm like, game. I am. I'm open. I'm so open. we okay. have we've roughed out a bowl now, and uh, we thought we would sit and chat for a little bit because I noticed that um, the the types of bowl gouges you use and and the way you're moving them, while familiar to me, are are not what I see most people doing at all, and and are a type of technique that I have been told in the past is very beginner. Um, and isn't necessarily, uh, you know, something that you would expect a, an advanced turner to be doing. So could you maybe talk a little bit about why you choose to use those tools and, and why you turn the way you do? Yes. Well, I think to begin with, um, I am a beginner turner. I've been a beginner for about 50 years. And the reason is because I keep a beginner's mind. I have, for the longest time, done things my own way and not, not the way everybody else does. At this point, there's, there's a, 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 a prevailing attitude that if, unless you're using a uh, fingernail grind gouge, you're not an advanced turner or, or, or whatever, particular techniques. And I, I just have a real problem with that because um, there are many ways um, to, to get to the form that, that, that you're after, and particularly with spalted wood. I think that uh, turning is a very personal thing. And for anyone who uh, says that you must turn a certain way, well, let them turn their way and, and I'll turn my way. And, and uh, you know, going on nearly 50 years now, uh, you know, I have a lot of different ways of doing things that people would, would be very surprised at. I've only recently gotten, uh, you know, four jaw chucks and only um, because uh, a good friend of mine, Terry Martin, and uh, uh, was coming to visit, and I wanted to make sure that I had chucks for him to use. Uh, and they're they're nice, I, you know. I like it. They're they're fine, um, but it doesn't doesn't matter to me. It, it's just another tool. It's another tool in the toolbox. <clears throat> What's mostly important is to is to have a vision of what you want to what you want to do, where you want to go with the bowl, and follow the wood. So everybody has their way of doing things, and I'm a live and let live kind of guy when it comes to turning. You know, um, a beginner in my mind is is uh, is a very you know wonderful place to be because th that means that you have the whole world ahead of you, or in front of you. You know, you have a whole all kinds of possibilities open to you uh, to where you can go. I, I want to have the beginner's mind always. Sari, let me ask you a question or two, if I may. Um, when you turn, what are you looking for as a turner? What, what, what are your main concerns? So I mostly use um, spalted wood. In fact, I don't necessarily, I don't think I remember the last time I turned a piece of wood that wasn't spalted, which makes sense because that's my, that's my research and that's what I work with. And so when, I, when I'm turning a piece of wood, I'm specifically looking to highlight the spalting as best I can. And I am often giving preferential form to the rarer types. So if I have a piece that is mostly zone lines that has a pocket of pink, I am going to alter form almost entirely just to make sure that that, that pocket of pink is not lost. Because if you're familiar at all with spalted wood, you'll know that um, you can get veins, um, like, sort of like marble. You can get an area that's green or an area that's yellow or an area of zone lines, and you might not have that anywhere else in the piece. And so you can go into turning with the best of intentions and thinking, all right, I've, you know, it's a, it looks like it's all zone lines. I'm going to make a pot out of it. And then you get in and you realize, you know, you start seeing those zone lines go away and you're thinking, oh, okay, um, change, change of idea. I am going to not do that anymore. And then you start, you start having to look at the piece more 
in terms of where the spalting is and following the spalting instead of following what you wanted to do. And that can lead to some very interesting shapes. And just because of the way fungi tend to grow in wood, it often leads to uh, pieces that have wider bottoms. It often, at least in my work, um, it, it can lead to pieces that need to have uh, thicker bottoms or that may not have a continuous wall thickness because again, the so zone lines um, will often run up and down a piece, but then pool, it seems like a lot of the times on the end grain and I like the, the circular zone lines and you can get them to do that on the end. Um, um, but the pigments, they tend to preferentially run radially. And so you'll see them streaking around the sides and you may just have one. So if you have nice zone lines and nice pigment, you may have a, a bowl that you want it to be, you know, a bowl shape and that ends up having a much wider base so that you can see the pooling zone lines and then we'll go something like that because there was that pink and you were not going to lose it. Right, right. So really you're, you're engaged in a dialogue with the wood and you're really taking your cues from the color and from the zone lines yep. and if, if you know that your next cut it's going to just remove what you have just uncovered, then you'll stop. At that yeah, point. and and oftentimes I'll just have a piece that will be like, okay, and and it's done. It, I hadn't intended upon it being done, mm -hmm. but I know enough about how fungi grow and, and how they, you know, what they look like that I can tell when it's going to be all right. This is this is the edge, and I can't do anymore. And there are even sometimes where I know that I can't <clears throat> even sand it at that point because. There are sometimes there are some pigments that are very very light, and if you get them in a high enough concentration to see like the yellows, um, even a bit of sanding can take away the saturation that you need. And so sometimes you have a piece and, and you're just done. That's it. You sound like a painter. <laughs> you know, it's that. How do you know when it's done? Well, you, when it's done, and um, that's kind of a bold move in, in the face of um, wood turners that um, have a right way attitude about about turning, isn't it? I well. I mean, to be really honest, I've had, I've had sometimes a difficult time with the wood turning community. Not as a whole. I have great. I have had great mentors through the whole thing. But you know, every so often, um, especially with with people when I'm when I'm doing demonstrations at symposiums and things, there's you know there's a, there's very much ideas about what is proper turning, and people are very nice about it. But you know, there are always the comments of that's that's different, you know, have you tried this technique? Well, this technique would work better for you from people who don't turn spalted wood. Yeah, well, you know, there, there's a difference between an actual beginner who is learning the, the rudimentary, the basic techniques of turning, and uh, uh, an intermediate or advanced turner who is keeping an open mind about how they're working or, or pursuing a different um, uh, vision. I, I'll tell you a quick little story about my uh, dear friend, Dale Nish. When I first began doing, yes, that, you know, Dale gave me that jacket there. And um, when I first began doing uh, the textured pieces, uh, which was a, about, um, 1979-1980 uh, where I was turning the wrong way on purpose uh, where I essentially uh, went back to when I first began turning and used to catch the the tool in the wood and it would make just horrendous gouges well then I started catching the uh, the tool in the wood on purpose and trying to control those catches and uh, creating very interesting uh, textures that revealed the grain of the of the wood um, and and it was different than being subservient to the material polishing and sanding forever um, and, it, and it was a direction that I was pursuing and when Dale saw that work he said this looks like something a beginner would do and I said really thanks Dale I appreciate that and, you know, it was, um, uh, it was an eye-opening thing for him because after a while the pieces began to grow on him. 
And it was a different approach and a different way of working. And I remember when I was first doing that kind of work that um, I, I had woodworkers and wood turners come up to me in all sincerity and say, you know, I just have to ask you a question. Why would you do that to the wood? I mean, I just don't understand. Why on earth would you, would you ruin the wood that way? And I said, well, you mean something that costs five thousand dollars is ruining the wood? I mean, you, you don't have a possibility that that it's something different that you haven't thought about before. And they walked away, scratching their heads and. And eventually, you know, went their own way and either accepted it or, or didn't accept it. And that's the whole point. When you're doing something differently than what everyone seems to be doing, what everyone seems to expect as the norm, you're swimming against the tide. You're going against the, the current. And it, it takes a lot of courage to do that. And, um, you know, you have to be able to withstand the criticism. Wait, do you get, I get this. I'm wondering if you get this. Do you get the, um, how long have you been, well, maybe not now, because like you're a <laughs> Mark Linquist, but at some point, um, did you get the, how long have you been turning when someone looks at your piece? As that sort of, you must be, and then when you say, well, I've been turning for, you know, 20 years or something, and they go, oh. When they, when they do ask, I say, it's been a long time. And, uh, you know, I refer them to um, magazine articles that, are, that were published in the 70s. That's the, that's the whole point. When you look in a book and you see a piece of work, you don't see how it was done. You don't know how it was made. You just see the final end result. You see what, what you know, is the product of someone's uh, work process and workflow. And that's the point of it. it. It's not how you get there, it's that you get where you are aiming to go. And, uh, you know, of course, how you get there is important because it's a personal thing, but that's the whole point. It's a personal thing. Uh, I think that there is an interesting thing that occurs, and it has been uh, uh, right from the very beginning, and that is the commodification of skill uh, levels and perceptions of skills and tools and things like that, which you have to remember, these things are all sold as well. You know, tools are sold and a certain kind of gouge is sold. And, and it's, someone said, told me that it was the, the new golf. You know, there's always a new putter. There's always a new... That's clever. Yeah. It is, because there's yeah. always a new tool or a new grinder or a new... Yeah. Something. Well, you know, my father used carbide tip tools at, at General Electric. He was a master machinist. And, you know, we used uh, carbide tip tools to, uh, to, to make uh, uh, very special turning tools that, that would allow us to make bowls in spalted wood very quickly and I used body grinders you know auto body sander on the outside of the bowl and it was it was a fast way to get to the you know a, a, a uniform shape with no a pecking or chipping and um, people were just shocked at that and um, I don't care you know be shocked <laughs> it's all the better controversy is a wonderful thing you know it doesn't matter how you how you make it. It's that you make it, you know. And and uh, I, I think it's you know I'm I'm I haven't been outspoken about this kind of thing for a very long time, and I am now because you know you've asked a couple of questions and and uh, I I think it's a, a very dangerous thing for for people to be. Uh, you know, creating standards that, that they expect everyone to adhere to. And that there are many ways to arrive at the, at the end result, um, many ways to get there, many ways to do things. Peter.